we are back. So we've straightened out that we have 20 million roughly to deal with and that if we can find a way we're sure we can use it, there might be more. But the big question is, how do we get this out the door with any surety we can use it? And if we don't use it, what's the backup plan? And Well, Madam Chair, one of the things that I think we, we do need to do is make sure that as we, as we craft the bill, that we leave sufficient flexibility that if those desirable things that we want to use it for just physically can't be done, but we can get some internet into the hands of people who don't have it, that we leave enough discretion so that it can be done. And, and, and with the least negative impact on the way we want it done. On the long term. Yeah, in the long term. So it doesn't preclude a CUD going in when they're up and ready three years, two years, six months but, from now. But at the same time, what we don't want to do is have a situation in which we tell people who have zero internet, well, you got to wait two years because we got to give a preference to the CUD. And I don't think we, I don't think that should be our policy. I don't either. I, I think if those kids are home for another three months next year and they have to go to Walmart to get their homework. Absolutely. Um, yeah, they, they need to be connected. They are missing Senator Benning's wife reading them a bedtime story every night. So. Something wrong with discount homework, Madam Chair? Pardon? Discounted homework. Discount homework at Walmart? <laughs> they might. Pencils. <laughs> okay, so. Brandy, you and Chris had an amendment, or Mar Maria, somebody yeah, has an amendment. Drafted something, and it's based on what we've done, and by, is by no means perfect over the past several days, and indeed, between the two of us, there may be a couple of changes we make as we talk, but it might be useful to have Maria go through the amendment, and then we can address it as, 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 as she's presenting. Yeah, I think it would definitely be helpful. Okay. And, well, can I happy. just, before we turn it to Maria, can I just tee it up a little bit, and and say we, we, I think broadly, are trying to say yes to the house, but not um, being quite as conscriptive of, as they have done. They seem to, maybe they are comfortable with their guesses of what can go in which pot, but I, I don't know that I have confidence that 2 million is the appropriate amount in the one slot that they have and 11 million somewhere else. So I think broadly, we're trying to give the department more flexibility, um, but also be protective of our sort of long-term interests. And that's the balance. And um, I don't know that we've hit it, but that's what we were trying to do. Yeah, at the same time, recognizing that uh, tomorrow or the day after, we're gonna go home for a period of time. And that period when we're gone, is going to be a very critical period for getting up and running what needs to what needs to happen. And so we did uh, place in here a role for the Joint IT Oversight Committee, the joint committee that exists off session. So there's somebody providing some oversight uh, of this process between now and the time we come back. Would you like me to pull up the document now? And Faith, can you make me a co-host? You're all set. Thank you. Okay. All right, is that visible to everybody? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, as the senators just explained, um, this is essentially collapsing two of the programs, the line extension program um, and the Get Vermonters Connected Now program. So there was 2 million in one, 11 million in the other. So this is now just one $13 million appropriation. Uh, but 
many of the provisions, uh, the conditions of each of those programs have been uh, captured here. So we'll go through them. We'll just, you know, briefly go through uh, subsection A to clarify what the overall mission of this new combined program is. So it's called the COVID Response Accelerated Broadband Connectivity Program, the program administered by the commissioner consistent with the requirements of this section. The purpose of this program is to rapidly and significantly increase broadband connectivity consistent with the federal parameters applicable to expenditures under the federal coronavirus relief fund in a manner that best serves the state's goal of achieving universal 100 megabits per second symmetrical service by 2024 as specified in section uh, 202C. Just interrupt for one second, uh, Chris, isn't it correct that that $13 million, which is the 2 million plus 11 in the underlying bill is actually raised to 20 million based on the info that we got from uh, Senator Kitchell? Yeah, uh, this was developed last night when we thought we had 13. Okay, well, there, but in that 20, there's also the 800,000 for, um, there's right. the two and the 11, but then they also have the 500 for the COVID response recovery plan and the 800, no, the telehealth connectivity program isn't. My but recommendation is that we don't worry about the numbers right at this moment okay. and come back. But they have, the, it's the 800 that's in there for the CUD planning, community response. Right. That's, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Okay. And that's the same number that the house had? Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. For that particular program, yes. Okay. Um, so then it goes on to say, to achieve this purpose, the commissioner is given broad discretion to allocate funding as he or she deems appropriate subject to legislative oversight as required under subsection M of this section to support the following programs and initiatives. And so you'll see listed here, and just um, if I can just back up for a second, a lot of the, I'm gonna call it boilerplate language, but because the house had two separate programs, there are a lot of similarities I took all of that language out of um, each kind of uh, sub-program and put it in more general language, um, which will be captured uh, in uh, the subsections that come towards the end in this section. Um, in any event, there is still a, a line extension customer assistance program, and we'll go through the details of all of these, um, but maybe just get through them once so you understand at least the context of what's how it's being allocated. There's the Get Vermonters Connected Now initiative. There's, and all of these are subject to the commissioner's discretion based on the need. Um, there's uh, the COVID response temporary broadband lifeline program. Again, commissioner's discretion as to whether to uh, create and implement this program. And there's the connectivity initiative, which is the existing connectivity initiative. Um, and this is just saying if there are grants that can go out through that RFP process um, within the parameters of the CRF funding, that that is uh, the vehicle that will be used. And I did highlight a couple of things, uh, just to clarify that to the extent you want to provide funds for fixed wireless service, um, I think this is the vehicle, this is the program uh, and the conditions of that program to the extent not further specified here that would apply. And we can um, discuss that further. And then I also just wanted to highlight that under the existing connectivity initiative, the funds are to go towards underserved and unserved areas and underserved for purposes of that program are areas that do not have access to 4-1.
I just wanted to highlight that uh, in case you wanted to Here look at that some of the wireless was for one. Oh, so this is these are the areas that would be eligible for funding for it. So they if they're under all right, that, all right. So this is the air, these are areas that are eligible under the current connectivity okay. initiative. Okay. All all of the funding and it, this is specified later on through this program has to meet a minimum of 25-3 service. If you want to adjust that, uh, we can talk, but right now that is specified that the funding here is for 25-3. So let's just quickly, we'll kind of go okay. through it. Does so, yeah. that mean at this, at this point that there perhaps ought to be a definition that says that uh, projects consisting, that projects that fall under this particular paragraph should receive currently receive less than 25 free i'm sorry so do you want do you want them to receive well, what, I'm, what i'm really asking is in in terms as clarity as to what we would be providing uh, under this subparagraph four would we be would we be saying that uh projects that could be completed consistent with the care act means a project you know has to be a project that delivers at least 25 free. Uh, you, are, you would be saying that. You would be saying that under four. Okay. Because the current connectivity initiative requires 25 three. And uh, in, a, in a subsequent subsection, it specifies that all of the funding here is for 25 three. You can lower that or you can adjust that. But so right now you're setting a floor and all of the funds would have to go to projects that meet 25-3. I just wonder if, you know, should, should we say that more directly so that people don't get lost in the verbiage like I just did? Uh, quite possibly. It, it might be helpful just to go through and see if, if that's addressed. Okay. Um, and if not, then absolutely, we can make it abundantly clear so there's no confusion. Because we did hear that some of these wireless systems, depending on the spectrum you're hooked up to did the 10 ones, but if you're getting four one, 10 ones, a lot better. Um, I'm thinking maybe at some point, and we're not going to do this tonight, we might want to at the end, I, I, you know, I think you've got JTOC in there, um, say, you know, a, you can get a deviation from this with the permission of JTOC or joint fiscal, just in case you can't get enough money out the door. I think that's a good idea. For 25, I'd rather get it out the door for 10 than send it to the UI fund, I think. And then that's one of the things that, that Representative Berglund was saying in terms of getting this out of his committee, because he had several members like Representative Pigley from Lowell who basically they get nothing and 10-1 would be a godsend for them at this point. Yeah. I got a lobbyist up North Street that had loved 10-1. She had to go off when she was lobbying because her kids got up and got on. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. you know, so, I, well, okay. I maybe we'll have maybe a note that's... somewhere. It might be quick, quick, uh, helpful to kind of quickly just go through the programs and yeah. then come back and revisit the kind of the significant okay. policy decisions that you want to make. Um, so, and then uh, just in five, there is that money for the department for their uh, to reimburse them for their Wi-Fi deployment. So this captures kind of all of the categories that were in the house proposal. Um, it in, it doesn't specify the amount for each of the programs. And then uh, in terms of the details of each of these programs, I won't go through them right at the moment, but you'll see in subject section B, this is the line extension program. Um, and for the time being, I left in place uh, many of the, of the house criteria that they established just for you. Um, to consider uh, or amend as you deem appropriate. Uh, subsection C, that's where you'd find the Get Vermonters Connected Now initiative. Uh, and this is- Madam yeah. Chair, uh, 
I just had a text asking if this could be posted. Um, as long as there's the word uh, draft or brainstorm, I don't mind it going under my name or maybe <laughs> could be under Maria's name. Uh, but it probably is fair for people who are trying to follow along to be able to see it. Faith, can you do that for us? I'm just sending it to Faith right now. I have great faith that Faith can do it. I do too. Okay. Um, I think I made a yep, couple of word changes from what I just sent Faith, um, but it's... Uh, well, yeah, this is a Faith. working document. It is um, changes very fast. Yeah. Um, so under the Get Vermonters uh, Connected Now initiative, under the House proposal, you had financial assistance for the kind of the installate the fiber to the home installations, the conduit, and the service drops. They also included fixed wireless. There, you can see that I've stricken that language. And not because I don't think you want to support fixed wireless where appropriate, but because I think that that would fall under the connectivity initiative, the existing program. And so now you're putting money potentially in the existing connectivity initiative, which again is to build out projects that meet 25-3. So I, I think that then would be the vehicle through which a fixed wireless provider would apply for funding. Um, but you know, let's we'll confirm all of this and make sure that it's consistent with what you were hoping to see. Um, then subsection D, uh, this is the authority for what I just called a temporary broadband lifeline program. Uh, obviously, this would just be for a limited period of time, and this is if it's deemed administratively feasible. Um, within the time constraints that you have. Uh, e, this is just the $50,000 for the Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, F, subsection F, this is again, similar to kind of the boilerplate language that was in each of the individual programs, um, you know, meeting the CRF criteria about, uh, Significantly increasing broadband capacity for distance learning, telehealth, telework, um, and also coordinating with and reflecting the department's ongoing efforts with Agency of Education and VPQHC to identify uh, addresses and clusters of students or vulnerable or high-risk Vermonters who do not have access to broadband connectivity. This would apply to all of the programs and funding uh, through this program. Uh, so here's where you'll, this might be a place where you might want a little more flexibility based on what I've just heard, but this is saying that any of this funding, so right now it's 13 million, will go towards projects that are at least 25-3, meet that service. However, Priority shall be given to services that are capable of 100 megabits per second symmetrical. And then there was a proposal with respect to fixed wireless um, that you're supporting fixed wireless that is served by fiber backhaul. So you know, we can revisit this and the policy decisions that you'll make, but we're almost done walking through the whole program. So it might be best just to kind of finish. Um, subsection H is saying just that the location and capacity of any infrastructure that's funded through this program shall be part of a permanent public database maintained by the department. Subsection I, I've just, as you can see, just highlighted, put a maybe. I know there was a lot of discussion about the role of the CUDs and what kind of input they have on funding within their service territories, whether they should have veto power. Um, and if so, how long of a time period do they have to provide that input? So I have some highlights and question marks uh, because I know you're going to be making some decisions about that. All right. And for anyone that's watching, the uh, document is now up on our website. If you've been trying to get it, you may need to refresh, but it should be there. Okay. 
subsection J, uh, again, this is kind of the boilerplate language about- Question, the Madam Chair. Question. Um, on, the, on the discussion of 30 to 10 days over possible vetoes, are CUDs obliged to warn meetings uh, ahead of time? Did they, but there might we run a foul of. Um, are they publicly held meetings which are obliged to be warned? Yes, I believe they are. I believe they are too. Um, so I don't if you know. have if you have a ten day warning, um, you or and you don't warn on the day you're notified. Uh, that you have 10 days to respond, you've, you don't have much, do you? Or can you have an emergency meeting? I'm just. And I don't know the answer to Yeah, either. unless we have standard bylaws, I assume that may vary with the CUD. So just, I wanted to highlight that possible question and I'm yeah. willing yep. to move along now. It's a good question. Okay. Um, uh, was, that, was there another question there? Nope. Okay. Uh, subsection J uh, just gives the commissioner authority to retain any award of financial assistance under this section until he or she determines that eligible expenses have been incurred and properly documented by the intended recipient. Um, subsection K. Uh, so this is new. Uh, to the House proposal, this is specifying that any funds under this program shall not be used to support a provider's costs associated with line extensions otherwise required to be constructed pursuant to a CPG yeah. granted under Chapter 13 of Title 30. And this was the issue that Senator Pearson raised yesterday uh, with respect to the cable companies uh, franchise agreements through the state and any obligations that they already have. Um, and a couple of people, catch. Asked me, what? A couple catch. people sent me um, the language of, for example, the Comcast uh, uh, CPG and under their existing uh, tariff, they would be allowed to use federal funds for their line extension obligations, but not state funds. These are federal funds. And so um, you're basically specifying here that uh, for the purpose of these federal funds, they may not go towards meeting their obligations. Subsection L is uh, basically asking the commissioner to consider and coordinate with existing stakeholders and initiatives including Velco and FirstNet to leverage private and public assets to the greatest extent possible in furtherance of the objectives of this program. Subsection M, uh, this is the legislative oversight provision. It specifies that on or before July 31st, and then again on September 1st, the commissioner shall report to the Joint Information Technology Oversight Committee. Oh, sorry. Joint it should be JITOP, um, Finance and House Energy and Technology regarding its distribution of program funds to date, the amount of funds that remain available for distribution and plans for awarding the available funds by December 30th. You'll note I highlighted that because there was a proposal to allow greater time uh, to allocate the funding here as opposed to the December 20th date. Um, and just want to flag that for now. Then based on the information obtained in the reports required by this subsection, the committee, committee may submit recommendations to the Joint Fiscal Committee concerning reprioritization or reallocation of program funds as deemed appropriate. Uh, and then finally is just the issue of unexpended funds and when you would like those monies returned to the state. Most CRF appropriations are required to be back by December 20th to allow for time for reallocation. I know there's been a, uh, 
there's been a request to see about extending that and then maybe quickly putting it into maybe the UI fund if that's possible. So I just wanted to flag those two issues. Yeah, hi. I mean, unless some Senate committee is meeting on New Year's Eve, no, it has to be reallocated by December 30th, right? Uh, it, it has to be incurred um, and expended by December 30th or it goes back to the US. Right. So I think we need to know it's not being expended by December 20th. So some lucky committee can re meet over the holidays and quickly expend it somewhere. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think any single committee can expend money maybe other than the that's true. Board, well, uh, we could give them authority. Yeah. Um, to, um, it, we could say any unused funds by December 20th shall be allocated to and leave that blank and let appropri appropriations is going to decide that. So you know, this is a larger issue that affects COVID funds throughout. Uh, not just what we're dealing with. And what Vermont needs is we need some receptacle to handle those funds and some process for determining what to do with them. And that goes beyond what we have here in this committee. I think I'd like a touch in on this one, probably with JTOC, yep. to make sure that the money is, I mean, if the money's not out the door by October, it's, not getting built. So, Senator Pearson. Yeah, well, th this is, your point is exactly right, Madam Chair. And, and I don't know if Maria, Maria's done a great job. We sent her this at 11 o'clock last night or something. So, oh, my hat's off to you. Thank you. I, um, unlike a lot of the um, CARES relief money, that is going to businesses or farmers or what have you. This is unusual in that we're going to pay, try to pay for building things. And I'm worried that, um, and, and in, in, in other cases, restaurants and businesses, et cetera, the onus is on the state where if, if we screw up because we give you a grant, but it turns out you were not eligible, the state is on the hook. I, I'm a little worried about that principle here, not because of the eligibility, but because of the timing. And so I, I had, I tried to outline the idea that, that if a provider is taking these grants and doesn't actually get it done by December 30th, that we not be on the hook, that somehow it come with a heavy onus or maybe it's a split, but but something that actually says to whomever takes the grant, if you don't get it connected by December 30th, you got to pay us back because we're we're trying or you know pick your dates in there. But but we just can't. Normally in this situation, you would get a call or a letter or something on December 30th and say, "Geez, we're close, but we got two weeks to go," and that will really be a problem in this case. And so, you have the power to extend it. And I, I don't know, I don't think that, I don't see that reflected here. Maybe it's not possible, but there certainly seems to be some, I'd be comforted if we could try and approach that in some fashion. So I, I'm sorry, Senator Pierce, I may have misunderstood then, I think no, no, what the direction was. Um, you know, one of the things that you might want to consider, and, and the department may very well do this already under their existing grant awards, is to not actually uh, allocate or, or disperse the funding to the recipient or retain a significant amount of it until they can show that they've gotten the folks connected. So then it's not a matter of getting the money back. There may be some initial capital costs that they'll require to start, um, but there may be a way of saying, you know, after that initial award, you don't get the full award until you can verify the actual connection. 
could we have the commissioner weigh in on this? Just is the I would I believe is here process already established or not? Yeah, this is Clay. Uh, if you can hear me, all right. Uh, we typically, uh, under the connectivity initiative, do not pay providers until they certify that uh, the project has been built and the customers are served, and uh, we go out and, and see the project. Uh, I think there's an additional component to that too, and that is with the line extensions, it's different. Under the PUC rule, the customer actually has to pay up front before the line is built. And so that would be a, a situation that I think would probably be worth um, replicating here because time is of the essence, but it does pose the risk that you're talking about. I've been trying to think about a certification process of some kind or some form of bonding, but frankly, we've reached the point now where the press of time is such that I, I, I don't have a good answer for you on this. Uh, I think the best you can hope for is put the money out there and if the project gets done, it will be because it was scrutinized as best as we could ahead of time. And if it doesn't come off, um, yeah, that's a, that's a risk we're taking. Okay, and that's probably, the other one is really a contract between the customer. You know, the customer calls up and says, I want you to extend the line to my right. house and I'll pay you. Right. Um, customers are probably, more likely to not have the three thousand dollars when the line gets hooked up than the state of Vermont is, at least precisely. Initially, maybe this year we it'll be different, but um, I mean, yeah, I, unless what, what, what I at. I can offer is that you know when we when we put together our our processes, we can do our best to give some thought to how to put that kind of check in there. But um, I'm at a loss to come up with something on the fly right now because um, we're talking about such a short window. Uh, I think it would make a world of sense to do what Maria said, which is withhold payment until you know, the very end. But you, you, we're all cutting it so close here in terms of the, the dollars have to be out the door uh, by December 30th. You folks need an opportunity to reappropriate if um, if you don't like the direction things are taking in October. And the, the more of these very um, reasonable but um, difficult uh, details and checks that we put on this, I think the less likely it is we're going to get takers. And that may just have to be where the chips fall here. But not paying until the project is, you may pay if you got to buy cable up front, um, right. but not paying until the project is completed is standard operating procedure, right? That's right. So, the, only, the only reason why we would be even thinking anything different today is because of this concern about getting those funds out the door by December 30th. Right, but if we get them out by December 30th and the lines aren't up and running, then we're gonna right. have it clawed back. So I'd rather yeah. have us hold on to it until the lines yep. are up and running. That's a very, that's a very reasonable assessment of uh, the situation. And if it, if it functions as a deterrent, then so be it. But I think we're at that place where um, those kinds of hard choices are, need to get made. And it, either you folks come up with something today or tomorrow, or you give us a charge to come up with something, and uh, we will do, we will execute on that. Like us tonight, and since it's five twenty six, and we set kind of a five thirty deadline, um, I'd like us to come up with just an agreement. You know, this is we put it all together. This is a general concept, um, and then tomorrow, perhaps we can start, you know, they, I think what the they appropriations needs is this big, we got one big tranche here and then we got probably the 800 for the CUD planning and 
um, anything else that's there. And then tomorrow, and I wish we could meet in the morning. They need, Jane says she needs it by noon. Um, and what I asked her was, could we just send you the, you know, the big divide up and then work on criteria. And then tomorrow afternoon, write perhaps an instruction document saying, in giving out these funds, you know, priority will be given to lower income neighborhoods, you know, priority, you know, not to damaging the future uh, development of CUDs, not to, um, you know, all the other, you know, protecting us as far as possible from exposure to clawback. Do you want to, meet, are, the, do you want to meet in the morning, Madam Chair, for an hour? Um, I'm not know. meeting, but I have a feeling Sandra Sorotkin's committee is meeting. No, our, our committee is meeting tomorrow morning. That's what nine, I thought. We're meeting at 9.30. 9:30. To, 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 exact, to do exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So I think maybe, uh, and I think we need more than like a half hour or so to to flesh this out. So I think the question is, can we agree on this kind of broad framework where we've just put everything together and we, we we left the 800,000 for CUD planning, right? Right. That's separate. Yeah. Is there anything else that's separate, Maria? Yes. Um, there's, we didn't talk about this yesterday, but there's the 800,000 for the telehealth connectivity program that goes through VPQHC. Yeah, and they, I think they said that, I think they said was separate yep. from us. Yeah, I believe I don't that's think right. That's separate from from you. I think that's considered part of the broadband twenty million from appropriations, but I will have to okay. confirm that with Stephanie. Okay. Well, we'll and include it if that's what they want done. There's the five hundred thousand for the telecom plan, the recovery plan. The recovery plan. Yep. So, so I do believe. These, do these are... numbers match what the house sent us, or are yes. these? Yes. Okay. And then we can adjust tomorrow afternoon, work on, like you said, guidelines. So the numbers increase oh. because again, Senator Kitchell had advised us that we could go to 20 million and what the house sent us did not go to that number. Okay. So we're adding money. So you're how much about an extra $5 million. I think the house had about 15 million. Yeah, 15, Senate appropriations is suggesting 20 million. Where do we spend $5 million? I, yeah, I mean, did you guys consider that last night, Senators? I'm just wondering if did you is, is that in your calculation that additional five? Well, my sense is that because we have put the bulk of the money into one pot and then given the department flexibility on how to use it, it's easy to increase the number. I, my 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 contention was I was never quite convinced that two million was the right amount to go to the one program they had and then 11 million for another so i think it's pretty easy for us to put in 18.4 or whatever the balance is um into this the construct here but the bigger question is our our you know this is an attempt to come up with the guidelines in yeah. legislative ease and are we you know are people thinking this is a beginning that makes sense or are we back to the drawing board or, or what? I mean, it's harder than you might think based on the last week of my life. Anybody got a better idea? So just- I don't see anybody jumping up to have a better idea. No, I, just have, champion. I, I just have a question. So uh, I'm sorry that I've missed this part. So your calculations did include the additional 5 million and that's in a pot where we're giving greater flexibility to the commissioner? No, the, no. the as you see in the draft, this is just puts the house's money all in one pot 
that's where it's 13 million. 13. So my point is that could just as easily be 18 million since we have not I see. worked ourselves to try to figure out how to divide up the money. We're, we're I see. Yeah, saying, Maria's you know, I guess my follow up, if I may, what, does it make sense? And I, I wasn't part of those house discussions. How did the house land at 800,000 for the CUDs? Should we bump them up a little bit more? Uh, uh, this, this is 800,000. Um, it was estimated about 100,000 per CUD, and that's for the recovery planning. Okay, thank you. The and... One problem in this, of course, is that Maria did her draft last night before we got the not notified by Senator Kitchell of the additional availability of money. That's why it's okay. not in. Thank you. So we'll put that in. Yeah, so I Senator think... Pearson's idea, I think, sounds. Sounds fine. Yep. You get more money, but I think it might be good to have a check back in October. I think the committee's going to be there because if we put 18 million in and we've only gotten six or seven out the door, uh, this is COVID money. It could go to businesses. It could go yeah. to all kinds of things that show up and there's no sense of our, cause you get to October and you know, you may have something that's a week from starting and they can put up some wireless, but if it hasn't been applied for by October, it's not going up I, by well, Matt, Chair, This is why I, as I look at, at Maria's draft on the last page, page six of her draft, she has on or before July 31 and September 1, uh, the commission will report to the Joint IT Oversight Committee and the, very, the other committees. And I would su suggest that it should read that on or before July 31 and, every, uh, and, and on the 31st day of every month thereafter until December 31, a report should be provided so that we know what money is being expended and what's pending. And then based on the information obtained, uh, uh, the way it reads now, by it says the committee, and I think it means the Joint IT Oversight Committee can submit a recommendation to the Joint Fiscal Committee, or, you know, if we're in session, the committees of jurisdiction and, and, and in terms of being able to make a change to this. Yeah, that, yeah, it, I think we should make it maybe even clearer that if the money isn't spent, you know, that, that well, I guess that we could just say, the, you know, depending on how the money is being used, the committee could recommend that it be reallocated to another COVID relief project. Yeah, now how we do that, we could do that with JTOC making the recommendation through the Joint Fiscal Committee when the legislature is not in session and the committee right. of jurisdiction being responsible for it when the committee, when, when the legislature is yeah. in session. Right. And that would probably end up being appropriations to reappropriate, but um, and we could do with the advice and of you know after consultation with us. But um, yeah, because I, I, I we need to to make it very clear: time is of the essence, and don't come dawdling in and you know November first and say, well, I guess I'll do something. Do we, okay. do we have, do we, have, so I think we all are, are, I'm hearing agreement and, and I actually think there's baked in uh, with our, what is proposed to be our fall schedule or, or late summer that, you know, we'll have a chance to think of this through again, but. Yeah, I do, think we'll be we here in any, October. Do we have appetite right now to talk about the, this whole CUD and public the, the, the feedback process, because that seems to me to be one of the, I, I'm not hearing broad disagreement, but how we do that um, has, could use some tuning. Oh, the 20, 30 days. Yeah, all of that. Uh, and Sarah McDonald. I mean, 30 days is almost, a, it's like a quarter of your time frame. Yeah, I, I thought it should be five days, but. I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, at least notice that the CUD is going to come out and say no. I mean, 
I don't think the CUD should have a veto authority in this, quite frankly. I think uh, anything, I just given either. the time frames we have, that the commissioner will evaluate these applications to determine if, 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 if the commissioner believes that it may harm the prospects of a CUD, yeah. that will then enable the commissioner to put a hold on, on, the, on, on that process. Otherwise, I don't think there should be a veto power here. Well, what was the veto? Why was the veto power put in? I mean, we haven't taken any testimony on this, have we? Well, the rationale was that some of the CUDs were afraid that by extending other providers into their network, it would make their CUD less competitive once it got up and running, and therefore less people would subscribe to the CUD because they'd already belonged to other providers. It was a comp for competitive reasons. That's that's yeah. why. Well, it's before we take before we move in, in that direction, I, before we make that decision, I'd like to talk to my CUD. I also have Representative Sibili in my district, who's been really involved in this. I'd like to have those conversations. Okay. Well, Mike, um, Sandra Campion, the what we'll do instead of this is in the guidance, we will say the guidance is you don't give, you know, a grant to somebody that will negatively impact, you know, the CUD's ability um, to expand. I don't think we want Comcast running cable or fiber through, cable. you know, through the center of your CUD and taking up the one flat road. On the other hand, if you got some guy that wants to put wireless out there and your CUD is still in the formative stage and they aren't gonna be ready to string anything for three years or they may not make it. I don't think we wanna say, sorry, people in that district, you can't have anything. Well, is so this something trying to thread that needle? No, I, I understand and I appreciate that very much. I'm just wondering, is this something that you want to decide now, or is this part of the guidance that we'll ultimately put together tomorrow? Uh, I, this is the guidance we'll ultimately put together tomorrow. Okay. Right. So I'd like to talk to my <laughs> folks. Uh, Commissioner yeah. has an idea. Sorry? Commissioner, commissioner oh, I can't. Oh, there's the commissioner. Yeah. You know, Senator Capian, as you have those discussions, maybe you would like to think about whether um, it would be good to have a charge on the commissioner to check with the CUD so that the CUD yeah. has a chance yeah. to provide input. And then that I think addresses Senator Brock's concern because it's not exactly a veto, but it also addresses your concern about ensuring that the, the CUDs have a good opportunity to make their case. Mm -hmm. And then it's pretty clear that you know, from my, where I'm sitting, we're doing no harm to the CUDs. And uh, Commissioner, what did you, was that your, your opinion in the House as well? Is that what? I don't recall testifying okay. on, on this on provision the in the House, but okay. I think um, however so it was characterized earlier, it makes a lot of sense. I think the idea was to give the CUDs comfort. But I think yeah. you heard uh, Mr. Purvis earlier today say that when you, when you step back and look at the scale of this, the, the amount of time and money I don't think is going to permit for existential threats to be created to the CUDs, but you have my assurance that I'll be looking for that. Thanks. Yeah, I, 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 do, I do like the idea of some process that is short that lets them give you feedback. And, that, you know, uh -huh. and, and maybe you have to look at it and say, well, you're going to lose five houses, but there happens to be four four families with students there, you know. Well, the, yeah, the other good thing about that would be that it addresses the pressure that I think uh, Senator Cummings has talked about frequently now, which is you don't want to make the, the CUDs the, the, the bet noir in their communities either. Uh, so you blame the commission. That's a really that's good a, point. That's a it's very a, it's good a, point. That, that's why I, I have the job, so you can blame me. <laughs> <laughs> this committee blame you? Never. No. Okay. Vermont, never. <laughs> All right. I've got Senator McDonald, who's been so, patient. Commissioner, um, with that authority, and it appeared that a cable company was running a cable and cherry picking a certain area that would make a CUD more problematic for the entire region, you would say no. I think it that's pretty good. fair, Senator. I mean, we have Rob Fish on staff now. And Rob's job is to know okay. the CUDS business up and down. So I have a pretty I'm, good I'm way reassured. 
I'm making sure, sure of that. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm not interested in them cherry picking anything. I hear you loud and clear. So, committee. Do we want to give Maria a whole evening uh, to rest so that tomorrow we can get a copy? We're on the floor at noon, 11.30. Noon. 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 Maybe we could meet at 11.30. Senator Sorotkin, can you work with that? Um, I probably, yes. Okay, so maybe we can just put in some of those final things we talked about and then we can finalize this. It's not a bill. I don't know that we have to vote, but we can and send it over. I think it's Health and Welfare did a 36 page letter, but. Um, <laughs> well, I, I would just say that uh, I, my hunch is if we could give them actual legislation that they would be happier. Would be pleased yeah. and probably be more likely yeah. to follow our lead. I think the letter was legislation, but um, there was a lot of discussion. Of course, we've had eight weeks to do it about, you know, getting very specific about things we wanted considered in health and welfare in every tranche. I think we can flesh this out tomorrow afternoon. Um, as long as they have the round numbers and the basic wording. And so, um, Commissioner, does this seem, you know, you've heard this conversation, are, are we wildly off track or does this seem workable the way we're, we're contemplating this here? You mean comprehensively the rework of 966, or do you mean something more yeah. specific? No. Yeah, no. I, Senator, uh, I'm an old army lady. I'm going to tackle the mission and get it done. And I, I think it's great that you guys are trying something. <coughs> and I think you set this up for as, as much certainty as you can have. So yeah, is it workable? We're going to make it work. And as you heard the consultants say earlier, you know, we may wind up doing things that in retrospect are not fully perfect, but it is so much more preferable to doing nothing. Okay. And I yeah. think, I, I think if, if you, you know, I reflected on your conversation from earlier today during the break, and I wished I had emphasized a little more that we have this data about where students are. It's, we're talking 1100 state students, give or take. You know, if we can get a good portion of them some help, you've done a good thing. That's, that's, those are kids who are going to be home being able to do remote learning if they're ordered back home. And if we can't do much more than that, that's, that's regrettable, but that is not on the state of Vermont. That is on the federal government. And, you know, if we can get the, if they've got nothing and the best we can get them at the end of the road is 10 something, yeah. it's something. Um, maybe at the beginning of the road, it's 25 three, but as you go out the road, it gets weaker and there's a point beyond which it doesn't go. So I, I would add to Madam Chair for what it's worth. Um, you, you know that the department is working on a plan for what we're defining as universal broadband and we're hopeful of you know, there being subsequent federal funding. And if folks get something in this build that is not up to that standard, 25-3, then they're still in the mix to get something if and when we get that funding. So help is still I, on the way. It, we don't wanna do that. Preference will go, yeah. but we may, that's what we were talking about. Um, Madam Chair, I do need to well, leave. We have language okay. by 1130 tomorrow to sign off on or not sign off on? Uh, yep. You'll have language from me. It, it doesn't sound like, I'll, I'll wait to hear if there's additional input. I, I think I captured or understand 
what your thinking is about the CUDs, giving them an opportunity to pro provide input, but leaving it up to the commissioner's discretion. Um, other than that, I think I highlighted earlier, I just wanted you to know that the commissioner does have the authority to retain funds um, and not disperse it all at once for a grant. So, you know, it's just broad authority to structure as she deems appropriate as well. And then I, were there other particular um, provisions you wanted me to add or clarify? You're, you're going to add the provision that says the commissioner's authority can be used to see that CUDs are not being undermined. Right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think, okay. yeah, I think yeah. that's in there. And there's also the authority that says nothing under 25.3 right that was in the first section i it is in there that all, all right i think i would like to put an escape clause in um with jtalk permission to get a variance on any of those because i don't want to find out that we can get 25-3 to half the road, but then because of the technology and the trees, it drops to 10-1. And we say to those kids at the end of the road, you get nothing because it's not up to our standards. I, it would take a variance. It would take permission from JTOC after listening to it. But I, you know, it, I'm listening to the wireless guys, and that does sound like we're going to get some of that just in the time frame to get it up and out and up those back roads. Um, I want to make sure that there's some flexibility in the funds to make sure that as many students as possible get as much as possible and 25-3 I know it's not perfect it's not our goal 100 100 is our goal I know that I know that 100 100 is our goal and we're settling we, for 25-3 I know that senator I've said okay. that let's I not settle that. for any less uh-huh but or You're going to call that, up that kid up the hill in I'd, orange and say, well, you don't meet our standards, so you get nothing? <laughs> so I want to give that kid a chance to get something. You, If it's under 25-3... Um, How do I the, know where the ticking's coming from? And it came from my door. But the underlying technology is is just as ro underlying technology that was built out, the fiber is just as robust as what it would have been if it had been 25-3, that's one thing. But if it's not 25-3 because we're allowing permanent installations to bring it down, that shouldn't happen. And I think the commissioner understands that and she could, uh, yeah. would, would, would see that yeah. that yeah. didn't we happen can't run if we car. told her so. Maria. I thought the feds wouldn't let us buy, build anything under 25-3. Uh, no, uh, no. Uh, the federal funding that's available now is for 25-3 service. Under the, I'm sorry, under their, the FCC's RDOF program and under the RUS program, that's the threshold they've set for those previously existing broadband build-out programs. Yes. The state with the CRF money, um, as long as you meet the other conditions for broadband, there's flexibility on what speeds you you want to fund. So, okay, you're trying to get those as many kids as possible hooked up um, in case 25. we can't open in September. So basically, okay. we, we better give Maria some ideas ahead of the time we meet. Okay. if we want real changes here, right? Yep. Yes. Any other real changes? So I've heard two so far, just the CUD, making sure that input is allowed and allowing Jai Talk to potentially 
recommend that um, funds go towards service that is below 25.3, allowing for that recommendation or, or JFC. Fair circumstances. We also had some reclaiming the money dates um, and some changes there, I thought. Yeah, uh, if money has not been expended by October 31st, JTOC, oh, okay. JTOC reserves the right to, uh, to ask the Appropriations Committee to reallocate in consultation okay. with the commissioner. You know, if you've got $20 million I, I and nobody's go. interested in it, we need to have the ability to reallocate it, maybe into the uh, the twenty million dollars to help the folks pay for their cable hookup, um, kind of thing. But well, she already can do that. We already built in the flexibility under okay. this. But but you're you had mentioned it earlier. Maybe it goes to a small business and has nothing to do with the internet. Yeah, I mean, it, if this is all COVID money, and if we're not going to be able to get it out the door, to wait to the build out money, if it's not out the door by the end of October, the chances that it's gonna go and anything's gonna build be built is pretty small. And I'd like us to have a process to get that reallocated and out the door before the end of the year, because I think everybody's got the same date. Does that work? I'm not seeing any no's. I think Senator McDonald has fainted. He's at least disappeared from my screen. <laughs> um, that all makes sense to me. Randy, do you want to talk to Brigland? You'd started that conversation or should we wait another day or what do you think makes sense to help us succeed all the way here? Randy, you're muted. Muted. No, I can I can send him a note. Uh, I've sent him a note earlier today with part of it, but I can send him a note just outlining what it is we're we're thinking about, where we're going, and making sure that uh, it would be something that that he thinks his committee could support. You know, this I think is all going into some bill, and it's going to get negotiated out between the Senate in the House, and I'm not sure what, I have a feeling it's going to be the Appropriations Committees, but um, I'm sure there'll be input from us and they'll want agreement um, on everyone. I don't think this is the end of the line. Um, I think it's going to be out I don't know if we'll be here Saturday or if we'll be here next week, but. In, in talking with uh, Brigland though, uh, having Maria's draft in hand before doing that, I think it would make it easier because then we yeah. won't be going for it. Yeah. So are you, that's morning, that's oh, you're not free tomorrow yeah. morning. Beg pardon? I'm trying to just want to make sure you've got time I have all the time in the world, Madam Chair. Okay, yeah, me too. All right, I got tomorrow morning off. I might get a walk in. Okay. Maria, will you send us all the, the most current draft or when you've made these little tweaks, please? I will, I'll, I'll work on that now and try to get that to you tonight and I'll email it to all of you. Okay. No, you know, you've, have you been told my rule? I don't want to get anything from any staff that's dated 2 a.m. What about 3 a.m.? <laughs> no, 3 a.m. isn't good either. <laughs> Madam Chair, this feels like a yes. gift to just thank Maria and Faith because they thought they were going to be done with us back in May. <laughs> in March or right. April. I know that Maria is one of like two thirds of our, you know, legislative staff that have kids at home. So I know that she's gonna get off this call and then be wrangling children. And so thank you. 
Staff has family and children that are hanging around and come home. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the next few hours, and I will see you at 1130 in the morning. Ending live stream.